Okay, so I think we're going to be in there. So good to see you. Hi, Sue. Yes. Hi, Andy. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. I'm just checking in on the group to make sure we're in there because it's always the awkward bit, isn't it? Uh, let's have a look here. I, I, I'm not even going that far. <laughs> Uh, I think, oh yeah, we are in there. It's great. Good to see you. Ah, well, thank you so thank much. You. Um, thanks for coming in, Sue, and having a chat with us today. You're very welcome. And hello to everybody who's uh, who's joining us. Oh, there we go. Got it on here already. Great. Um, and this is the first chat of the first chat of the new year. So that's um, so. Thank you for being the first guest. Uh, we'll just wait for some people. Year, I can see the numbers. Uh, yeah, I can see the numbers ticking up. Uh, sorry, so yeah, it'd be more chance to say Happy New Year as well. It's a bit late in the month, but never mind. It's always good to do it. Um, yeah. <laughs> we're, I can see the numbers are, are whizzing up, so that's really good. I'm just going to let some more people come along and uh, have a chat with us on this Sunday afternoon. So uh, we've got the wonderful Sue Williamson here, uh, who's uh, a good friend and colleague and also doing amazing things in the field of grooming and especially cooperative care. Uh, we're going to unpack some of the terminology a little bit today, Sue. Um, Sue is the author of two great books, um, Taking the Gur Out of Grooming Your Dog, which is for caregivers, owners, and Taking the Gur Out of Grooming the Grooming Salon, which is for professionals. And this is all lots of color pictures and things in there as well. Uh, and you've also got a group, haven't you, uh, Sue? Yeah, I've got a Facebook group, which is Taking the Girl Out of Grooming Dogs, and that's a Facebook group, and anybody can join that. So caregivers, um, rescues, behaviourist vets, trainers, guardians, groomers, hopefully as well. Anybody can join and ask questions about um, helping their dog through the grooming process. And also, I have quite a few guardians ask for um, a consent-based groomer near where they live. So that's a really good uh, advantage for it as well, that we can hopefully match up some caregivers and some groomers that want the same ethos used on their dogs. And you've got, um, it's, uh, you've got quite a few members, haven't you, in that group? Yeah, we just did 12,000 this week, wow. so, uh, and that's just over two years, so it's an, it's an amazing uh, achievement in two years, I think, without me really pushing it. Um, it's quite nice now when I see, a, a, because we've, there's lots of grooming groups, obviously, and you can guarantee two or three times a day my group's recommended if somebody's struggling with a dog, so that's quite nice to see the group recommended uh, with another groomers Facebook groups and I think there's definitely been a shift hasn't there we're going to unpack some of this today during our chat and um, uh, there's definitely been a move to a bit like in my community in the training community the training behavior community there's been a, a look to doing things uh, differently to look to what more can be done especially from a dog-centered point of view and I think the number of people in your group is a real testament yeah. to that, that people are either yeah that's how I work and that's how I operate or I want to know more I want to learn more about what this looks like and I think that's what's so great about your group is you've created a safe space so that people can access some of these things and ask those questions and um and learn more without the kind of the judgment that can come sometimes from or the, the feeling we get sometimes when we're asking some of those questions yeah and that's it it's not about uh if you remember my group you've got to use all the all the techniques I use you may not have absolutely any prior knowledge of consent grooming about dog behavior but it's about inviting people to join us to see see what consent grooming is how it can help the dogs how it can help the groomers and the guardians as well and just making a more uh, relaxing environment taking the taking the literally taking the girl out of the grooming salon um so there's no criticism on the group of oh we shouldn't be doing this you shouldn't be doing that it's about if they're doing something we don't agree with it we don't criticize it's just this might be better to try this method you know the, you know putting a muzzle on whilst it's safer for us it doesn't always make the dog feel any better um but if you you know took the grooms more slowly you might not need a muzzle 
Uh, that's the, some great points. Well, um, well, I want us to have a look at during the chat at some of the practical applications of some of this. But before we go into it, then Sue, uh, let's hear a little bit about you. Then, just to start off, you know, how did you come in? What's your? Because I know you've got um, a T Touch background, and so you kind of came in already thinking about some of the elements from a emotional experience point of view for the dog. So tell us a little bit about how your own journey, Sue, and, and uh, how you came into it, and then we'll look at some of the specifics as we unpack it. Okay, I think I think my grooming journey started probably when I was about four year old when my dad's cousin's wife gave me a toy poodle. She, she was about the same age as me and called it Tina. Um, not a traditional name for a dog, but that was the name. And I just adored that dog. And that was one of my first experiences of dogs. Also, my auntie had a German shepherd and I loved that as well. And, I just love being around dogs and I always have done it. And I think I've got quite an affinity to dogs. Dogs, I seem to attract dogs to come near me um, and be friendly. And I wanted to be a dog groomer when I was about six years old and as I was growing up and I was told it wasn't a proper job, which it probably wasn't in those days because about all the dogs that needed grooming around then was probably, you know, your Cocker Spaniels and your Poodles. Um, so I went into administration, worked to various places and finished up working at De Montfort University for 24 years. And it was 24 years, uh, sorry, it was six years ago yesterday that I did my last day at De Montfort University to enter into the dog world completely. I'd already started my talent and T-touch training, so I was learning lots about reading dog body language, the emotional experience, and working at the dog's pace rather than my pace. So I'd already got that background be before I came into grooming, which I think has made the big difference. I'm sure if I didn't have the behavior knowledge behind me and I come straight into grooming, I'm sure I would be still grooming. Um, well, probably I wouldn't because I've never felt comfortable doing that, but that, I'm not sure if that's because the knowledge I ha already had or because it's just innate in me to make things pleasant for animals. So I did my training and then decided that I wanted to work on my own salon. I didn't want to go work elsewhere. And when I first qualified, I did, I, I groomed how I was trained, but it was becoming more and more obvious to me that the dogs were really struggling um, with various things. I, I, one of the things I, right from the work out, I didn't want to ever use a muzzle because to me, if I have to use a muzzle, I've missed something earlier on. I've missed some body language or a calming signal early on that the dog's not happy. So I think putting a muzzle on can make you a little bit cocky and not watch the dog quite so closely to feel how, um, what their emotional experience is. So after a while, I stopped using the, um, well, the first step I did was I stopped hanging the, um, safety aid on the, the bar across the top and I'd just have the, cut the, the collar on and I'd just clip it to my, my tunic and I was finding the dogs were actually then just sitting down and relaxing more on the table so I decided then well actually would it be better to put a harness on them rather than have the collar so I used one of my tutor harnesses I just happened to have at the time and a lot of the dogs seemed to relaxed even more without something around the neck with something attached to it. Um, so then I started using the harness for all the dogs rather than the a collar uh, to, and then if I did need to keep it on the, the, the H bar, I could do. But then as I got more and more into it, I, I stopped using restraints or the safety aids altogether because I was finding the dogs I was grooming I just didn't feel that they needed it. They were sitting down. I was reading the body language well. So that became one of the first things, lose the restraints. Um, and I felt much more comfortable myself about that. Um, and then I've got, a, I used to groom a, um, a golden doodle. She's actually a case study in one of the books. And she was a devil to groom. She, she, she was, she was known to be aggressive. She was a known biter. Um, and I still didn't want to use the muzzle. Um, and she just came in one day and laid down on the floor and wouldn't get up. 
And I thought, you know what? I can't get this dog onto the table. She's too big. So I just sat next to her and groomed her on the floor. And she just lay there the whole time. And I thought, you know what? This makes so much more sense than forcing a dog onto a table, making it stand there for two or three hours, being stressed, me getting stressed. Uh, a big dog like a golden doodle, obviously, if that starts throwing its weight around, there's the risk that the table falls over. So from then on, I just groomed her on the floor. And now um, all big dogs are groomed on the floor, medium sized and small dogs get groomed on a low table. Um, because if I groom on the low table, I don't, having the safety aids is not a risk at all, not using them. And I've also got a little caravan, a set of caravan steps, so the dogs can get on and off the table as they need to. So rather than it getting a little bit, oh, and I've not noticed, rather than having to, you know, do a snap or a growl, they just get off the table and it just makes it for a much more relaxing time for them and for me. You know, so I've been, I've been, when you see my head down this, I'm making notes, because I'm making loads of notes here about everything. Yes, I thought you might be. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's amazing. I, I love hearing you talk because it's so effortless for me as I'm not a groomer, but uh, just hearing you um, instinctively, I guess. And, and I think that background you have, especially mm -hmm. coming through the behavior and tea touch sets you up to very much look at that emotional experience. And um, something I talk about a lot is the friction between a, having the task orientated um, pressures and the care orientated needs. And grooming in, in its essence is a task orientated uh, activity, of course. And it's where you put things, if whether you put the task ahead of the care or whether you start with the care to build the task. And that's what you're describing there. And, and you're very much, yeah. Everything's an invitation, I think, from what you're saying. So you're inviting that dog to partake, to go through that experience with you and you're getting feedback all the time. Uh, is this okay? Is that okay? Is this gonna work for you? And I think what um, a lot of us know and what a lot of caregivers might not necessarily is dogs who struggle in the grooming environment, we ultimately presume that it's something about the groom that they don't like. But actually for many of these dogs, there are other things they've got They've got um, attachment issues. They've got, uh, you know, they, they struggle in novel places. They struggle with novel people. Um, there could be, uh, you know, we talk about this a lot, physiological issues where they're like, wow, I'm going to really struggle to stand for that two hours because <clears throat> physiologically I find that difficult. These are extra things that come in. And I think um, there's been a bit of a misunderstanding, I think, in some quarters. Uh, I remember somebody uh, saying, uh, or asking me, what's all this rubbish about consent grooming? Are we supposed to say to the dog, do you want to be groomed today? No, oh, we won't bother then. Uh, but it's not that. It's about recognizing that dog's emotional state and how they might be. In the, and, the, and a good analogy, I think, for me, because we can all relate to it, is being in the dentist, right? It's, it's a, you know, oh, God, recognizing yeah. <laughs> the task at hand, but having the difference between a dentist who's going to listen to you, especially if you're sensitive and you struggle a little bit to slow things down, and give you a chance to say, yeah, I'm ready for the next bit. I'm ready for the next bit. I've processed that bit. I know what you're doing now. Um, and actually listening to you talking, especially reading the books, some of these grooms that can seem to take forever, they're a battle because there's the battle between I've got to do this task and the dog better not, you know, the dog struggling against it. Actually, these grooms can be done quicker by slowing down. Yeah, exactly. I, I groom a cockapoo, um, and he, he struggles with everything right from the word go, he, he comes in. And if I think if he went to a traditional groomers, I don't, I really don't think, he's not a dog that I think would bite, but I think he'd just have a nervous breakdown and he really struggles with everything. So um, actually he's it, it, quite good with the bath now, he'll, he'll get into the bath now. So what I like to do, I like the dogs to get on and off the table themselves, in and out the bath themselves, because that to me is almost permission to bath them and per permission to work with them on the table. But I think if I've got to force the dog into the bath, it's not gonna be a pleasurable experience for either of us. Honestly, there's nothing worse than having a big dog in the bath that's wet through trying to get out. It's, it just doesn't lead to a, a, a successful groom so we've also found him he doesn't like a towel he doesn't like being dried with a towel 
So instead of drying them with a towel now, I've bought some of the rough and tumble drying gloves. And it's absolutely fine with me drying them with those. They'll sit on the table while I give them a really good rub down with those. Makes it worse that you just don't like the dryer either. So what I do now is I wet clip him. So I, I get as much as the moisture out with my, my gloves. And I just take his coat and it goes quite short because he's got really tight curls and it's really difficult to keep him mat free unless he goes quite short. Um, and he'll let me do his torso. Uh, he's quite good with his face as well. He struggles with his legs though. He's got real um, issues having his legs groomed, which a lot of cockapoos have in the poodle crosses. They all seem to struggle with the, well, a lot of breeds seem to struggle with the front legs so I always start doing some uh, feathering on that which is discussed in the book where I just build up contact with his legs gradually uh, with a, uh, a little painting brush and then when he can cope with me going all the way down his leg with a painting brush I then go down with a normal brush and then I just scissor down. Is it a perfect finish? Probably not. Will anybody notice when he's on a walk? No. So to me, we've got the best of both worlds there. I've got a dog that's short that the guardians can manage at home. He won't come in matted next time. I've sent him home without being too stressed. And he's, he comes, he actually walks into the salon himself. So I've obviously not done anything too stressful for him. What I've, one of the things I'm concerned about with stressing dogs out in the salon, particularly dogs like Alfie, is that his guardians have got two young children. So I don't want to send Alfie home trigger stacked for them to be around the children because they're quite young children and then potentially cause a bit of friction between Alfie and the children if they touch him in the wrong place. So by keeping his uh, threshold low, his anxiety low, I'm sending him home in actually not much worse condition than he came in emotionally i hope right so <clears throat> so many awesome things i'm screwing notes down again here so <laughs> there's there's three strands from what you've just said that i just want to unpack a little bit of each one so these are three i want us to look at um the thing about stacking and the knock-on effect outside the salon um breaking things down i love uh you were talking about using the paintbrush to get the dog used to the sensation and um you know uh, i've seen sarah fisher talk about things like that and others i think it's something i do myself with my yeah. own uh, i'm not a groomer but when i get dogs uh getting used to doing the stuff training that kind of thing yeah use it getting the dog to think okay that's okay i can process that and then finally this notion of it not being perfect i want us to look at these three things because for me this is almost the essence of a lot of why we do these things. So if we start off with this thing about stacking, then I've worked with so many dogs where there are presentations happening at home that we can directly kind of track back to difficulties either within say um, dog boarding, uh, sort of uh, doggy daycare, grooming, whatever, because that dog's nervous system response is so high but they're just being suppressed through muzzles, um, restraints, or in the doggy daycare center, no option for exits and that kind of thing. And that nervous system then is just offloading back home. Uh, and the caregivers are wondering yeah. why, because they don't make the connection. And I think it's really an important consideration that just because we can exercise more control within a salon environment, for example, I think it's really interesting earlier. I think a lot of people will really be interested to hear you say, you try not to use muzzles because for you, um putting that muzzle on is more okay keep you safe but it doesn't stop the dog getting stressed uh, and actually you could just push forward no. further now because you know they're not going to bite you rather than think actually you're already telling me that's enough that's really interesting but yeah so this notion of stacking then to talk about that a bit more soon so trigger stacking um if you're a behaviorist or a trainer you'll know about trigger stacking but trigger stacking is when lots of little incidents build up so um, uh, the one I, I usually do when I'm doing my workshops is one day I was going away in my caravan, it was a scorching hot day, so I was already a bit yucky, you know, a bit hot and worried about the dogs, how they were going to cope in the car on a journey. Uh, I got to go and pick my caravan up and the back of my car was full of stuff. And I'd got my caravan keys on the car next to me, so already I was a little bit, oh, and 
I was driving down the road to go and pick my caravan up and somebody pulled out at a junction on me so I had to slam my brakes on and everything off the back came flying forward and my keys for the um, caravan storage facility dropped between my seats and I thought oh it's not a problem I'll just sort that out when I pull up at the traffic lights so pulled up at the traffic lights and I couldn't get my hand down the side so already I've got the heat I've got somebody pulling out of me I've got everything flying forward and then I can't get my keys so by now I'm starting to feel a bit panicked so I get to the uh, facility where my caravan is and I thought well all I need to do is go around the front seat shut my hand down the side and get the keys and I couldn't reach my arm wasn't long enough to reach so I had to take everything out the back of the car but when I opened the back door I forgot I'd left half a dozen eggs on the top and they fell out and smashed so by now my tr trigger stacking was about here somewhere so I, I get everything out I get my keys and just as I'm putting it all back somebody pulls up behind me and pips his ear at me well that was that was the straw that broke the camel's back and he got a, a mouthful off me basically any other time somebody picking me I'd have put, oh, you know but because I've got all these triggers built up and I was so frustrated and so stressed that that just one last trigger was just too much for me and um, me swearing at this guy is sort of equivalent to a dog biting so a dog's sympathetic nervous system well the nervous system works in exactly the same way as ours so as they get more and more anxious more and more little things bother them they get to the point where they they feel their only response is to bite well they don't feel because it's a, an automatic reflexive response so when you think about the grooming salon even before many dogs have even reached us they're already well trigger stacked you know they might have pain they might have had a car journey and they don't like traveling they feel sick then they have to come into the salon it smells weird if it's the first time they've been here it's all that new stuff to process it might be the flooring they don't like, it might be the echo of my salon, it might be the smell. So again, that's lots of little triggers that are going to add to the dog's uh, emotional experience. And then there's any previous experience they've had in grooming salons. Um, have they had a bad experience somewhere before? That'll add to the, the mix as well. So for some dogs, even just getting them into the bath, they're fully trigger stacked at that point and they're thrashing about in the bath. So trying to continue the groom when they're at that level of anxiety is, is pointless really, because one, you're not gonna get a good finish. You're gonna be absolutely exhausted fighting with it. The dog's gonna be absolutely exhausted and stressed. And it's just not a, a good outcome for, for the guardian, the groomer or the dog. And also I think there's so, a notion of, when we think about, I spoke to um, a groomer a little while ago, I, I did a kind of a presentation for an American uh, grooming organization and uh, uh, the lady, the groomer said, um, uh, but the dog's got to learn, the dog's got to learn that that's not acceptable. And I, I get where, yeah. she, where she came from with that. <clears throat> but for me, when we step back, what is the dog actually learning? So if the dog is growling and we're, and the person was, the, this groomer is implying that we've got to say no, we've got to shut that down so they learn. When we, when we had this conversation and I said, well, actually, maybe also the dog is learning, nobody's listening to me. No relief is coming. My, my form of communication isn't working because I'm trying to communicate to you. And uh, the groomer got it then when she saw it from a different point of view. And this is the difference again between that kind of quite quick thinking task oriented process. I've got to do it. You need to shut up. I need to get on with it. Uh, and recognizing maybe the dog's trying to communicate something. And we all know those early bits of communication are worth listening to because they're less likely to elevate from there, are they? Yeah, they are. And dog, most dogs are really good communicators if you know how to listen and they're allowed to talk. So one of the things I do find for dogs that have come from another groomer is that the first time they don't seem to be many calming signals or show much body language they are still quite shut down in the environment but the second time they might be a little bit more feisty because they realize they're actually allowed to communicate and now listen and then by the third time they realize actually this lady listens to me I don't need to be feisty I don't need to shut down I just need to communicate in a normal way and 
she'll change what she's doing or stop what she's doing or give me a treat. Yeah. So it's all about recognising that, you know, it's the dogs are not being naughty on the table. They just cannot cope with what we're doing. And I think that's that's the difficult bit for a lot of people to understand that it's not bad behaviour. It's just an outward pouring of their emotions. Yeah. And this brings us to the next thing, then. just a little point, by the way. Um, <clears throat> uh, we've got Dan coming into the group for a chat, actually. Uh, in the near future but Dan Garrett's um, stress release book is a great book for people who want to understand a bit more about stress and also about how we can help dogs through self-regulation of that stress so it's a, um, it's a really good book uh, I was looking for it on my shelf I can't quite grab it um, yeah Dan Garrett's uh, stress release book is a good book look at Dan's, Dan's going to be joining us soon but um uh so understanding stress, I think, is important. One of the problems, of course, uh, Sue, is we're not very good at recognising stress in each other, let alone in dogs. I think that's no, part of the problem. No, no. Uh, and this is why I like the term relief so much. That I keep talking about relief because it is about trying to offer that relief and allowing, uh, you know, uh, that dog to go through that kind of more of a regulated process. But the second thing, there's, there's three things. So the first one is about stacking. I think that's really important that we recognise that quite often that dog on the grooming table, they're how they are in that moment is about everything they've experienced within that period of time. It's not just about, oh, the dog doesn't like the head, right? Second thing was about breaking no, things down. No. And I think that's something you described um, really effortlessly, really about slowing things down and exposing the dog to a little bit so they have at least a chance to process that bit and just let that nervous system back off a little bit. So they're like, right, I get that. Uh, even yeah. like using the long uh, artist paintbrushes just to get the dog that feeling of being touched by another person even. You're going into their personal space and having that sensation so they can relax into it before you build up to the brush. Yeah. And it, it's like, going to, for me, it's like going to a new hairdresser. Everybody brushes differently, different pressures different speeds and for some dogs that are touch sensitive that is so much more so much more different information they're trying to take on and they're trying to process the being brushed by being with a different person being in a strange environment the guardian not present and a lot of dogs really struggle to process that level of information all at once it's like I, when i did my workshops i tried talk to the groomer saying imagine if you were just picked up and placed in the middle of uh, Leicester Square on New Year's Eve and all these people are there and lots of noise lots of flashing lights you just stand there and think oh my god what's this and it's very it's it's not on such a big scale obviously but to put a dog in a grooming environment um, particularly if there's naughty groomers there, there's lots of noise going on, lots of smells, lots of sounds, lots of people, other dogs, lots of contact. It's just so much information for them to process that they don't have the time to process before the next thing happens. And then they can't catch up with all that processing. And part and, of the processing, you know, we, yeah. Sorry, Sue. So, yeah, and what happens then is the dog shuts down and the groomer thinks, oh, it's sitting there doing nothing, it's fine, and I can carry on. When actually it's not fine, it's just not showing any behaviours. And that's a, that's a dangerous place for me because that's where a lot of the problems start. I love that because this is really important, right? <clears throat> I think anybody who's listening in who doesn't necessarily look you know who's, who's um doesn't practice necessarily in this way at the moment but he's looking to shift it's a really fundamental principle that a lack of behaviors does not mean the dog's okay or does not mean a nervous system at rest and especially if that dog is trying to give behaviors to try to seek relief or trying to communicate need and it's being shut down shut down shut down on those things so the dog seems okay we're more likely just to get an explosion from that dog at some point. And I've heard this so many times from colleagues, both in uh, rescue, veterinary, grooming, different areas where the dog seemed okay. And then out of the blue, we say that, um, the dog just kind of goes, yeah. you know. And so it's better to keep those that communication going all the time, isn't it? Even if that communication is the dog's telling you, I, I need to stop. 
Yeah, and by stopping when they ask for it, they can process that little bit that they need to reset them, get that relief, reset themselves, come back, and they're quite happy to carry on. Uh, it, it actually amazed me the first time I um, used MAP protocol. Uh, I'd got a dog. My friend had asked me if I could group, groom him because he was going to a big, um, big grooming salon and he was being done by two groomers and he had two or three restraints on and a muzzle and they were still struggling to groom him. So she says, I understand if you don't want to groom him, but will you try? And I says, of course I will, you know. And I thought, well, I'm not going to put him on the table because he's already got bad memories of the table. Um, so I bathed him and he was fine being bathed. He was really good being bathed. And then rather than force him on the table, I just sat on a mat. And every time he came and sat on the mat next to me, I stroked him. If he got off the mat, I stopped stroking. So we quickly learned that being on the mat meant he was going to get touched. Being off the mat means he wasn't going to get touched. I didn't chase him around the salon. And then it was, you know, just slipping, putting the clippers on and off and then just clipping him. And whilst he was on the, the mat, I would clip. When he moved off, I stopped clipping. And he would sit for about four or five strokes of the clippers down his back. He'd get up, walk around, walk around the back of me and come sit back down a few more. Get up, walk around a few more. And I was able to groom him. No muscle, no, no safety aids just on the floor, just sat next to me. And it was really peaceful, groom, and his, his garden actually was amazed that I'd actually managed to do as good a job as the previous groom has had. So it, it's sometimes it's not even about getting a better finish by using all the additional tools that we can. It's, yeah. it's just getting it done in a safer way for the dog and for me, because obviously I didn't use the muzzle and I didn't want to get bit, so. Yeah. That's really important. What you just said there is really interesting because um, we're going to come on to the not perfect thing in a minute, but yeah, that need to move, right? Uh, we all have it, that kind of, we can all have that sensation of, I, I, you know, I, I need to move, I need to have a bit, of, a bit of fresh air, I need to kind of have a time out. Uh, that is a really important thing and it is for dogs and they need that chance to be able to just opt out for a second and again having the opportunity like you just described really well there because you were in a space where the dog could be like right that's enough for a second I just need to kind of do whatever he needs to do and then to come back around and this is something else about consent uh, anything really it isn't about the initial shall we start okay great I'm going to carry on there regardless it's that constant waiting for feedback to kind of exist, are we still okay? Are we still okay? And going back to the dentist analogy again, uh, especially for somebody like myself who is really nervous in the dentist, I've got a great dentist who she checks in with me a lot. I have the opportunity to say, whoa, hang on a minute. <clears throat> and I think with dogs, if they have the chance to say no, they're more likely to say yes when they're ready because they know that they can have some exactly, yeah. agency in the process. So it's not if I try once, they say no, I can't cope with that. It doesn't mean I'm not gonna try again after a few minutes, perhaps try a different technique, perhaps do a little bit of desensitization first. It's just about finding a way that the dog can cope with what I'm doing. So I've got a, um, a, a Jack Poo, a Jack Russell Cross Poodle that comes in. And when I first started grooming him, he would come in and he took his legs under his body so I couldn't groom his legs. And he made it so difficult that, you know, he didn't always go home with his legs perfectly done, but he, he was up short and he came with every six weeks. So it was, it was tidy enough to go running around the, the horse yard, the stables where he spent most of his time. But he comes in now and although he still doesn't like his legs being touched, he doesn't hide them anymore because he knows that once he gets too much, he just steps off the table, goes and has a look out the window and then comes back. And I'll do a little bit more. I'll do a bit of desensitization. I'll do a bit on his back leg and give him a few treats. And so he doesn't feel the need to have to hide those legs anymore. So it's, he, he did say no at the beginning, but he doesn't mean he's always gonna say no now because He's, he's grown to trust me. He knows I'm not going to fall, I'm not going to hold on to his leg for dear life and force him to have it done. And we've got to the point now where I can do his legs. Again, they're still not perfect, but they're perfect enough 
for what his guardian wants, the perfect enough for him and the perfect enough for me. And I'd actually challenge any other groomer to try and get a better job done on him. Certainly without stressing him out because he's a bit of a stress, stressy dog anyway. And I think this is the um, bit of a trap by having a very task oriented view when we're just like, I'm going to do it because uh, so you, if you feel, yeah, I'm going to do this to you now. And I'm going to make sure that we do this now. So it becomes all about that bit. Whereas actually, like you say there, because it will not come back to that. Then my husband, uh, as people may, may know, is a he's an end of life nurse and he has to do personal care. And um, uh, sometimes somebody isn't ready for that bit of the care but they will have something else done. Uh, and then you you come back to that later and say, okay, should we do that now? And I think it's just recognizing that just because the dog won't do it now, doesn't mean they won't do it even in five minutes time. You know, I think this is the important thing. And the more we get stuck into no, this must happen. And this comes on to this thing about the pressure I know a lot of groomers have about some that you can, I think it can be very easy as a groomer to put your professional image your your professional stall if you like on the final groom how it looks and i found that um a lot of my um colleagues i speak to like yourself many of the clients they come in with a task in their head i want my dog to look like this that's what they do but actually if you communicate back to them look do you know actually today rover really struggled with this or you know we had to do it this way and it doesn't look quite like that because of this the feedback I get from you and many of the groomers is the majority, the big majority of the caregivers, the guardians, the clients are really respectful of that. And because ultimately they care about their dog. Some people, it's the look they want. I get that. But the vast majority from what I hear are like, OK, I understand that because it's been put across. And I think some groomers are worried about not giving the perfect look because of the client and what that kind of feedback is going to look like. So um, could you share yeah. some of that? Because I think it's important for people to hear from a groomer that actually it can be, it is often the other way around that you get a better response from the client when you explain that why Rover hasn't necessarily got that perfect look. Yeah, I think it all comes from training, uh, the way we're trained, because the training is all about the task, about getting the dog, this finished dog, uh, looking well styled, um, nowhere is out of place, angulation on the legs. To be quite honest, not many guardians really care about how angulated the legs are and whether they've, you know, one bit of fur on one leg's a bit longer than the other side. Obviously, I'm not talking about massive bits. But also, from what I've been talking to other groomers, a lot of groomers are not talk, told about communication to clients. That's not talked about at all. So. I found, like you said, if you talk to the client, you explain what the dogs are struggling with, what alternatives there are, then they're much more understanding and they'll give you free reign to, to do what you need to do. I've got a cockapoo that comes in and when I first started doing it, the Guardian wanted a kept really long and fluffy, but she's, she's got a coat like a sheep, tight, there's tight, tight curls. And she couldn't keep a brush. So second time she brought it to me matted and I says, we're not doing this. You know, she, the dog doesn't like to be brushed. You're struggling to brush her. That's building up mats. That's even more uncomfortable for a brush. And that means when you bring her to me, I have to sh shave her on my shortest blade. So we compromised on about a centimetre long fur each time she comes to be groomed. And we've managed to keep that and she never comes in matted. She's always happy. She, she's not bothered about being brushed now. So it makes the life easy for the guardian as well, as well as the dog and as, as, as me as well. I don't want to be keep having to clip a dog off every six weeks that's completely matted. It's not comfortable for the dog, me, and the guardian doesn't like this shaved look. So it's about uh, managing the expectations of the guardian based on what the dog can cope with. Um, a, a lot. I'm actually quite in a fortunate position because most of my dogs are with clients are referred to me now, so I I lay it out up front exactly what my rules are. Uh, you know, they either give consent and let me do it. I'm not going to force the dog. So if I can't get one area done one groom or 
I can't even get any of the groom done, then my clients understand because I'm the, you know, I'm their last resort other than uh, sedated vet clips all the time, or having their dog being put under a lot of pressure to get the, the perfect groom done. I think this is a good point you make there because many dogs, of course, they uh, they tolerate or accept the grooming <clears throat> experience. Uh, and um, uh, I think as a groomer, if you have those difficult dogs, the ones that you feel you have to put a lot of extra control and uh, uh, and kind of different measures in place, there is always the option of referring either to local trainers and behaviorists who, who do the who do um, uh, consent based husbandry training. Um, or other groomers who are more um, kind of a fay with dealing with some of those things. It doesn't have to be more control, more control. There are other options to, to refer. I just want to talk about the, the professional landscape a little bit, Sue. Um, uh, before we, I want us to finish off with uh, talking about some of the small things that groomers can do. So they can, those little things that you can start to do that isn't a big shift, but that can actually help a lot. But just looking at the professional landscape, um, I see a profession that is really coming to the front of things now. And I, and I think uh, I, I get involved with a lot of educational stuff for, for, with groomers. And uh, it used to be, oh, well, I'm just a groomer. I think those days are moving on now because uh, grooming in itself is a, is a very important profession. But actually many dogs will see a groomer more than they'll see a trainer or a vet or anybody else and i think what is exciting about this at the moment is recognizing that uh groomers who have a bit of understanding about stress about body language about uh physiology about understanding uh you know some of the some of the early signs that a dog might be uncomfortable that feedback we were talking we touched on it a moment ago about how to communicate back to the client that feedback can be really yeah. helpful, actually. And this is something that I would really urge groomers to think about with your CPD is, yes, invest in how to do the different grooms and go on those kind of courses. I know there's a lot of CPD in the, in the um, grooming space yeah. for that. But also to think about going on courses where you can learn about a modern approach. It's really important because sadly, there's a lot of stuff that isn't quite so up to date, but a modern approach to understanding behavior, body language, stress signals, um physiology and that kind of thing in a basic way so that you can think actually do you know it's really interesting today because rover couldn't stand today he could last time but he was really struggling today or um you know rover seems really stressed when i go around that part of his body that kind of thing that's a really important part of the uh evidence basing process back to the caregivers you know uh, and to kind of reference them to maybe go and speak to the vets or uh to help the caregivers to understand that they haven't got a naughty dog but they do have a dog that might struggle yeah, I I used to groom a Lakeland and he, he'd never been, he was referred to me from another groomer because she couldn't get his face done. I actually managed to do his face the first time and I groomed him five or six times, never had any issue with his face until probably the sixth, seventh time. And I did his left side of his face, absolutely fine. Went to do the right side, he was not having any of it. So I managed just inside his mouth and he got a massive abscess. So that abscess was causing him so much pain, he didn't want me to touch that side. Now, if I'd have been focused on him being naughty, I might have stuck a, you know, stuck something around his mouth so I could keep that shut whilst I scissored the size of his face. As it turned out, I just rang his owner and I said, look, he needs to go to the vets. And he finished, you know, he had to have antibiotics, came back the next time. He was a little bit anxious still the next time about having that side of his face touched. But by the, again, by the third, fourth visit after that, it was fine with me again doing that side of his face. So it's not always about thinking they're being naughty or they're finding difficult. Sometimes it is pain that they're, they're struggling with. So I think we always have to keep our minds open to why is this dog struggling? Is it emotional or is, is there a medical problem that we need to refer to the vets? And, the, and I think that's really, really um, important consideration. I think we all know that more often than not, it's not a case of a dog won't do something, it's like it's they can't. Either they, they don't have enough headspace open to them to cope with more or they're physically 
uh, or cognitively compromised at that moment. And this is the thing as part of the professional landscape that I am interested in and, and keen to support. The cooperative holistic consent based trust base, there's lots of names I know, uh, is still yeah. seen as being something quite marginalized within the professional space. And actually I feel, and I say this as a non-groomer, so I, I, I'm cautious of my words, but the, a good positive progressive future for the grooming community is to embrace more, in, you know, to, in, to encourage groomers as part of their CPD to learn more, not just as a, an aside, but as a, an important part and recognize how important the groomers are as part of what I call the care circle, right? So we've got uh, yeah. veterinarians, groomers, trainers, behavior. we're all part of the care support of these wonderful animals. Uh, and actually groomers are saying many of these dogs will see groomers more than any other care professional and uh, shifting away from the task oriented element of grooming to a care element, uh, I think is where the industry needs to go really for the future. Well, I, I think that's the, the obvious way to go for me. I mean, I, I have some of my guardians today because the dogs have separation anxiety. Uh, some of them travel probably two hour, two, three hour round trip to see me anyway. So I'm not going to be making them go and sit outside in the car when they've had a long journey. Um, some dogs are just so much better with the guardians there. And that gives me a chance to educate the guardians as well. So I've lost my train of thought now. So making the groom easier for them, the, the guardians can also see how I'm grooming their dogs so they can follow through that at home as well. And I know that it is frowned upon in the industry of having guardians stay, but for me, it's, it's a no brainer. And I've had quite a few of the guardians stay that have said, it's so calm in here. It's such a calm environment. Now, if the guardians are picking up on that, then hopefully the dogs will be as well. I don't get stressed because I'm not backing a dog on the table because I'm not task driven. I haven't got to get that leg perfect. So I'm not battling the dog. I'm not getting stressed because I can't get it perfect. You know, if, if it's just a little bit out, oh, well, I'll get that next time. Um, and it might seem a very flippant way of grooming, but it suits me and it suits the dog and it suits the guardians. Uh, I've also, going back to something we said earlier about the after effects of grooms, I've had quite a few guardians as well saying they're totally different. The dogs are totally different when they get home from being groomed by me than they have been by previous groomers. Uh, and that might include the dogs eating straight after a groom rather than not eating for two or three days. Uh, I've got one client whose dog used to go and hide under the bed after a groom. And what I want, what I really want to get across is it's not that the groomers are necessarily doing anything wrong, but if it's something that dog doesn't like, like Alfie with a towel, if I continue to dry him with a towel, that might be the one thing that he goes home and he's got that stuck in his head and somebody might pick a piece of fabric up at home and it reminds him of this towel and he just turns. Well, it won't just turn, it'll be because of that. So it's it's not like we're blaming the groomers for being harsh or we don't think, we know that the groomers are not hitting the dogs or being really rough with them. But if it's something the dog doesn't like, it's something that's going to trigger stack them and make the groom more difficult for them. So I think that's that's a really important thing to say that by changing just some of the things, being more observant of the, what the dog's trying to communicate to you. And this all comes back to training because uh, most of the courses don't include any um, dog behaviour information. Some of them include uh, dog behaviour, but it's the dominant space model. So the dog has to do as it's told on the table. It has to shut up, put up and shut up. Um, whereas, you know, with those with a more up to date scientific behaviour knowledge, know that it's finding ways so the dog can cope with that part of the groom. Uh, I personally would love to see more behaviour in the dog training because I really can't, I, I still can't get my head around the fact that people, the groomers groom dogs without knowing nothing about body language and calming signals 
and trigger stacking and how the autonomic nervous system works. So there, for me, are the key things that really need to be included in the training of, of groomers. Uh, that, that should be the first module they do about dog being eaty so they know what they're dealing with. And I think that will reduce a lot of dog bites. I, I definitely, and I think this is the really important point, and you, and you make it very important there. This is, like I like I said a moment ago, um, the onus is on the wider industry to think about the direction of travel really regarding CPD and education, because um, all the groomers I know, they are really passionate about dogs, they're passionate about their work, they, um, they, uh, they care. Um, yeah. What is lacking is the awareness. Uh, which is this whole process, I use the term supported awareness, that's the whole point, is supporting more awareness. And you, you learn that through listening to people like yourself and um, uh, we've got Steph, of course, Steph Zickerman and others uh, who, um, who are talking about these things and providing uh, spaces for more CPD and learning. And I think the industry more generally, especially the culture that's within it and the, and the bigger organizations need to really support that notion. I don't see yeah. this, what you do as being something that is fringe. Uh, I think it is something that is, should be integral, um, but it doesn't mean that people have to make huge, big sweeping changes. It's just even hoping our conversation today will help people think, yeah, actually, maybe that dog I had last week isn't being challenging or difficult or naughty. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's because they're struggling to cope. And I think it just shifts that view. Um, uh, I was going to say something, I can't remember, isn't it? Uh, I've lost my train of thought. I've got so many notes on here. My pad is absolutely covered in scrolls uh, because you Don't just talk about so many things. Uh, we could do a lot more time. But I think um, that's a really important point there, I think, about that. And I think uh, moving forwards then, um, what are the things that you feel that are really easy or accessible to most groomers, the small things that can make a big difference? You, you, for you that you think that, that uh, groomers could adopt or try and see how that goes one thing of course is we both we're both um, connected to the pet remedy product for example which um yeah. uh, we've got a big grooming study that we're publishing very soon actually uh with about uh i think it's about 80 salons and something like 340 dogs uh and the results are really quite amazing but um uh so i know a lot of groomers just by adding in some calming products can can be a difference, but what are the things, um, what's, tell us some things, some small things that groomers can make a change to that can make a so difference. So if you it's really easy if you're a one-to-one -one groomer, uh, because there's lots of things you can do. You can groom on a low table. I've got a little stool I sit on and I've got my table low. So that makes a big difference to some dogs. Um, using a harness based, uh, safety aid instead of a collar and a belly strap that gives the dog a better sense of balance because the uh, I've not got my stuffy dog in with me but the the clasp where you put the the lead up to the h bar that's more central on the dog's body so it firstly to make the dog feel more balanced because that is that safety aid is in the middle it doesn't pull on the neck so much so if you've got one of these dogs that's constantly got its head down you're not going to be pressing on the, the windpipe. So the reasoning behind that is if you think about it, if you're stressed and then somebody put their hands around your throat, that would make you feel even more stressed. Um, also, I know a lot of groomers that just use the neck restraint rather than the neck and the belly strap. If you've got a harness on it, jumps off the table, it's not going to damage its throat and neck. Um, and I just find the dogs are much calmer with that on rather than the, the, the neck and the belly straps. Uh, so that's, you can do that even if you're in a multi groomer salon. I would like to see all puppy grooms slow down massively and bring the, the puppy in uh, the salon, perhaps after everybody else has gone at night or first thing in the morning or just have a special slot in the week where you can bring puppies in let them have a look around the salon start to process the sounds the smells uh, a lot of groomers do puppy introduction packages but they seem to start it to an advanced level so they might get a bath on the first trip that's far too much in my opinion uh, so th that's something everybody can do as well um, as you say, the pet remedy, 
I use quite a lot of talent and tea touch in the salon. Um, I do offer a course if anybody wants to learn enough tea touch to calm dogs in the salon. But there's um, other techniques you can use as well. Learn, please learn about dog behaviour, particularly the, the body language, the calming signals, um, the trigger stacking and the autonomic nervous system. They can be found in my book, by the way. Um, so that you know what you're dealing with and it's about being more educated uh, so a lot of the time it doesn't mean making massive changes so if you've got a dog on the table that's really struggling with its front legs being uh, clippered scissor them instead do some desensitization work with the legs get the guardians to do desensitization um, and make sure you, you are doing desensitization and not flooding. Um, I've seen a lot of groomers think they're doing desensitization when they're actually flooding the dog. So they're doing more and more and more, not watching the dog's reaction. So if you've got a dog that, say, doesn't like its legs being held, just holding onto that leg until it gives up is not desensitization, that is flooding. And in the end, they just shut down because nobody's listening to them. So take things a little bit slower if they are struggling enough with the front legs done and you've tried the scissors you've tried the clippers just do a bit of work on one of the back legs or on the torso and then go back to the front leg and just mix it up so that they can process a little bit of information slow the groom down if you are in a, a single groomer salon give them time off the table when they are getting a little bit um, agitated, give them a few minutes to calm down. Things like licky mats, snuffle mats, kongs where they can lick and chew. They're really good decompressors. Um, anything that involves licking um, and using the nose will help them start to relax a little bit. And using food actually is also a good indicator of how anxious they are because if they can't eat food, it's often because they're too anxious. So I hope that's given a few tips of how to make that start to make a few changes of course join my group taking the go out of grooming dogs because you can ask questions on there and i'm always happy to help anybody take more consent-based approach and say a lot of the dogs the, the dog alfie i was talking about that struggles with nearly every part of the room i can do him in groom him in one and a half hours now one and a half hours two hours is standard for a cockapoo so by taking a slower approach with him actually means I'm probably doing him quicker than most cockapoos because I'm not faffing around with those tiny little bits of fur around his feet that are sticking out or mm. making sure his ears are perfectly symmetrical. I mean, they don't go out one ear up here, one down here, but, you know, there's making sure he goes out relaxed is much better to me than go, making him go out looking perfect. And I do think it's groomers ourselves that put the pressure on us to get that perfect look. Yeah, and I perfect think... is, sorry, perfect is something that we can aim to do later on when they can cope with the smaller things. It doesn't mean to say they're never gonna be able to have a perfect groom. It just means not at the moment. And I think this is really important because when we when we shift to that kind of care oriented approach, it is about building things up. And um, uh, I remember when I was a kid, I hated going to the hairdresser, to the barbers, as it was back then. And uh, I used to have yeah. to just have a really simple kind of short back and size because all I could tolerate. And it wasn't until I was a bit older, and more comfortable uh, that I could do more. And it's the same kind of thing, really. Um, I think it's taking pressure off. The as a professional taking pressure off yourself really and thinking right I'm going to set my store I'm going to set my business my brand my my reputation on the care and support I offer the dog during the grooming process not necessarily about what I can do each time and I think many groomers that I've spoken to just that subtle shift is a big relief actually because uh, the pressure that can go on especially if you've got a dog who is quite uh, you know struggling the responses are, are quite challenging at times in that thing that you're just building up pressure for yourself thinking oh my god they're coming to pick him up in half an hour and I still haven't done this and I still haven't done that so actually it can be less stressful for the groomer as well right yes yeah, certainly for me I, I find it more emotionally stressful than physically or because I 
I feel sorry for the dogs, you know, they're struggling and sometimes I can't, I try different techniques and I don't always get it right the first time. So then I, I feel guilty that I've probably caused just a little bit more stress than I needed to, but eventually I'll find the right technique for that dog. Um, and it's actually really um, satisfying finding a way to enable that dog to cope, but it's also really good CPD as well. I've learned so much more about behavior, about the little nuances, about different techniques to groom by working with these more stressed dogs for grooming, you know, dogs that have got more grooming anxieties. I've learned far more than if I'd have sat reading a book, for example. Um, so it just gives, gives me more to, to work with and more to share with other people. Um, just simple things sometimes like, uh, I, have to, I do a really old um, Cavalier King Charles and the information I got from his guardian when the first time he came to me, he'd been, his previous groom had retired, was that, oh, it just lays there and lets you do what you want. Now, that's also flagged to me anyway. Anyway, I put him in the bath, started bathing him, and this dog just collapsed on me. I thought I'd killed him. So I wrapped him up, took him out of the bath, put him on the floor, and he started running around the salon like something possessed. Um, but what I've found with him now, if I put, I have a bowl of water with a bit of shampoo in and a, a shower, fluffy thing, scrunchy, and I wash him down with that and then I put the shower head in a glove, one of the dry mitts, and rinse him off. And he can stay sat up, he doesn't need, he doesn't stress him enough to have to, you know, for his systems to shut down and for to collapse on me, so little tiny tiniest things sometimes can just make a big big, big difference i call it, call it the kaleidoscope effect you know you just make a one one chink to the right and it changes the whole picture that's a good analogy and i think one last point on that before we kind of uh, finish off because i can't believe it the, the hour's gone already but <clears throat> i've worked with a lot of groomers who have um to kind of just from an education point of view around the emotional experience and and that kind of thing and it makes good business as well because uh for those dogs say many of the dogs that come in the salon they cope okay and that's fine and it, some of these changes can make a big difference for them as well of course but uh some of the dogs who need a bit more time they need a bit more space to kind of process uh the groomers i've worked with they've 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 charged for that this is the thing and then yeah. you end up getting a reputation for being able to do that kind of thing and um so uh you you know you you can charge your worth for this stuff it's not a case of thinking well i'm just going to charge the same those dogs who need more time they need more space it makes good business sense as well um and uh, i worked with a lady a groomer uh, last year who um has set up consent clinics uh, as part of what she does so um a couple of evenings a month people who str dogs struggle people come along without the dog she just uses stuffies just to go through what it looks like the things people can do at home people pay for that they come along uh, when it was all with the covid she did it via zoom instead so there's all sorts of opportunities to build in your business model here yeah. for doing these things i think just basically learning about dog behavior it it enables you to help with other little in bits as well so uh, like I've got quite a few dogs that get travel sickness. So by being able to recommend the pet remedy, a little bit of tea touch, I can help them outside the salon as well, which then makes it better for the grooming because they travel to the salon and they don't get the travel sickness anymore. That's less stacking before they get to me. So by having that extra behavior knowledge, you can talk to the guardians about, you know, the, the dog's emotional experience in more detail and get them to think about how they can change things as well. One of the things I do with all my new clients, they all get a copy of my book, Taking the Girl Out of Grooming Your Dog. And it's really good because you give it the first appointment, the second appointment they come and they're talking about, oh, that, that was a trigger, that was for him. And I noticed this, he doesn't like this because he licks his lips when I do this. So it's educating the guardians as well on dog behavior, just even if it's little tiny bits, that can they can then make their dog dog's life more pleasant or 
they can just learn to recognise when the dog's a little bit more concerned that they hadn't picked up before. Yeah, and it has a ripple, think, it has a knock-on well, effect, doesn't it? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. And if you know what you're talking about, the guardian's more likely to listen to you on the grooming front as well. So if you say that your dog, you know, can't cope with grooming, if they know you've got that behaviour knowledge behind you, they're going to listen to you more than if you haven't got that behaviour behind your, your, not, you know, your advice. Well, Sue, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, and what we'll make sure we do is um, uh, maybe when we've finished, uh, if you could pop your link to your group into the thread of this chat. Uh, and then uh, when we, um, when I get this uploaded to the Dog Center Care YouTube channel, we can, um, we can uh, make sure there's a link there as well. Uh, and um, uh, just to remind everybody, your books are Taking the Guru Out of Grooming Your Dog, which is for caregivers, uh, and Taking the Guru Out of the Grooming Salon. The one for caregivers is really good to have in the salon anyway, like I say, for those dogs who struggle a bit to give something for the caregivers, the owners to take away, I think it's really good. Um, well, I really appreciate yeah. your time today, Sue, and I think this is such an important an exciting area because I think from uh, from my community looking into your community I can see there being this new landscape that's appearing and and additions to the professionality of groomers you know uh, that the, those extra strings to the bow that, that are being offered and um, and that space is including and definitely I think uh, shifting towards more of a cooperative care start of grooming is definitely nothing to fear I think you know like you say you've explained already about some of the small changes that can be made that can make a big difference it's, and uh, and I think more and more groomers will be wanting to do that well I hope so and if, if you do join my group contact me and I'm willing to help anybody I have uh, I have got a, an online monthly subscription platform which uh, includes things like talent and tea touch about dog behaviour, animal centred education, free work, which is something we've not really covered in today, but that's a brilliant way to introduce new dogs to the salon. Uh, handling techniques, how to deal with your clients as well. So, you know, if you, I'll put the link into that as well. So if I've got any groomers that want to join that you know uh, there's a wealth of knowledge there that I've used that you know uh, is live um, I video all my grooms now so that I can use them in the hub and that's a really good thing as well to do start videoing your grooms and look back because I've missed stuff and been able to see actually it might have been better to do this instead of that so it's actually helping me as well what video all my grooms That's really good. That's really we'll good. Get your phone out and video all your grooms. And we're doing, uh, I'm doing a webinar for you, aren't I, as well? Uh, we can put that in the group, uh, yes. just looking at the, um, the kind of emotional experience side of things, but especially looking at uh, the psychology behind some of the outlooks of these things. So I'm really looking forward to doing that with you soon. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, um, that's, just that's to be amazing. Just to let everybody know, our next uh, live is going to be with um, the wonderful Dale Ward. So Dale uh, and her book, Raising the Worst Dog Ever. Uh, Dale, that's going to be a great conversation, especially focusing in on young dogs, adolescent dogs. Dale's got a great story to tell, and I'm really looking forward to kind of welcoming her uh, to the group um, for a chat for the next one. So keep an eye open for that. Thanks for joining us, everybody. And thanks again, Sue. It's been amazing. I think we could... Uh, yeah, we can talk a lot about this stuff, but hopefully it's really got people understanding. Oh, I could talk all night. Well, that's true. I know that from personal experience. <laughs> uh, says he, you never shuts up. Uh, but yeah, so that's great. Well, nice to see you. And uh, thanks everybody for watching. And thank you, Sue. Bye. Bye.